Hello, and welcome to the Hoboken Historical Museum, where we are streaming live from Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And what we do on Thursday night is we talk about Hoboken. And I am the uh, host tonight for Hoboken Talks. And uh, our special guest tonight is Rabbi Schoenberg. And we welcome him from the uh, Hoboken uh, Synagogue. And uh, as a reminder, you could also watch some of our uh, older shows on uh, YouTube, which is our home base. And uh, we have um, a wealth of information about people from Hoboken. And uh, please join us interactively between YouTube and Facebook. And uh, our production manager, uh, Rand, will be the arbiter as to what comments will be presented to uh, Rabbi uh, Scheinberg. So uh, please, if you can, you know, because it'll help with the show if we have some interactive uh, dialogue. And, uh, you know, we look forward to uh, spending some time with you tonight. Uh, and Rabbi Scheinberg, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm really excited to be here. And, uh, you know, you've been, I think, We've discussed this a little bit from our uh, last week when we spent a little time with the uh, Purim. Uh, you started in uh, 1997, I think, with, with Hoboken. That is correct. This is the one full-time job I've had in my life. <laughs> and uh, I was glad to come at a, at a good time and be able to, to work with this community over a period of significant growth and significant change. And it's been a very exciting time for me. So what made you uh, choose Hoboken of uh, the whole United States? You, you picked our lovely town here. Well, let's see. So immediately after I was, I graduated from rabbinical school at the Jewish Theological Seminary in Manhattan. Uh, my wife, uh, who is now also a rabbi at that time, was a rabbinical student. We were looking to be still in the New York area. And I was also a doctoral student in Jewish liturgy and was looking for somewhere I could be for a couple of years in close commuting distance to Manhattan and finish up my comprehensive exams and some of my language requirements and then move on to an academic career. So things happened a little bit differently. I'm very, very glad that I've been able to pursue the, my primary career in the congregational rabbinate, though I also am involved in uh, academic aspects of, of my uh, life in Judaic studies as well. And uh, it just happened that this is a good fit for me. And also that I arrived here just at a time when the community was in a, a, a period of significant growth. And what I assumed was going to be a place where I could be only for a couple of years turned out to be a place where I could be for, for longer than that. That's very, very nice. Uh, you know, and I, I've known you for a long time as well as my parents and uh, Michael and Ellen. So, uh, you know, it's uh, oh, it's my there's speaking of Ellen. So uh, Ellen says hello. She has a shout out to you. Uh, hello, Ellen. And obviously, Ellen has spent time in the uh, United Synagogue. Uh, so the synagogue has two different names. I think the congregation is one name, and the building is the Hoboken Synagogue. So maybe you can sure yes. So the building was completed. This building, which is right uh, behind us in this picture, it was completed in 1915. The congregation was founded as the Star of Israel Synagogue, founded in 1905, and then the building completed on 115 Park Avenue in 1915. And then, and maybe we'll get to a couple of documents a little bit later, there was a merger between the synagogue and another synagogue across town, at which time it became the United Synagogue of Hoboken. So for a while on the facade, was painted the words United Synagogue of Hoboken. But during our one of our recent restoration efforts, we, just as we've restored the interior to look as close as possible to how it looked in 1915, we've restored the exterior also. We're on the registry of, National Registry of Historic Places. And um, as part of that process, uh, we decided to, again, reveal the original words on the facade. You can see it in Hebrew. I'll move aside here. It says, Kehila Kedosha Kochav Israel, which means the holy community, star of Israel. And then below that, you can't see it in this picture, though, uh, it says in English, star of Israel. Oh, very, very, very nice. And and obviously, um, 
we spoke a little bit about we had 830 Hudson Street where what I guess there was like a, um, the rabbi's quarters and maybe some chaplain that we used to have. So uh, and over the year, I believe, you know, the decision was made to focus on one location and actually build on a, on the left hand side of our screen. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't think we spent a lot of time growing up in this particular uh, synagogue because I think it was too difficult to heat and maintain. Mm -hmm. So they used to focus on 830 Hudson Street. Um, right. So that's how the synagogue became the United Synagogue of Hoboken. What happened is in the 1920s, there was a split and there was a, 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 a faction that left and then founded the Hoboken Jewish Center at 830 uh, Hudson Street. Uh, the, the Star of Israel was an Orthodox congregation and the Hoboken Jewish Center was a conservative breakaway congregation. Uh, and uh, but then by the 1940s, they remerged again and became the United Synagogue of Hoboken, but holding on to both buildings. And uh, yes, the 830 Hudson Street building was uh, more like a multi use kind of space with a sanctuary seating about 70 or so people. And uh, for a while, it did look like the Star of Israel Synagogue was just outsized for the, the the size of the of the Hoboken Jewish community, which maybe we'll talk about. It was founded as an immigrant community uh, at a time when Hoboken had some 70,000 uh, uh, residents. And uh, this building with a sanctuary that, that seats 400 people or so very easily uh, was the right size at that time. And then as the community dwindled, how could you possibly imagine that there'd be enough Jews in Hoboken to fill up a building like this? And there were some efforts to sell the building Apparently, as I've heard, this uh, uh, the block, the 100 block of Park Avenue was one of the most crime ridden blocks in Hoboken <laughs> and that this is just not a property anybody would 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 want. There were some visionary people. We mentioned Joel Freiser actually before Joel Freiser as a person in his 20s arriving to Hoboken together with his uh, wife, Marilyn, uh, walk into the synagogue immediately, the youngest people in the community. And so they point him and say, like, would you do us the favor of being becoming the president? Because we've all been the president already. All these uh, people who are in their 70s and older. And he also suggested to the community, someday younger Jews are going to move back to Hoboken and don't contemplate selling this building. And, and in and, fact, and he was right. He was right. He was completely he was, right. He was right. And uh, by the 1990s, the decision was made in the late 1990s to sell the 830 Hudson Street building. And then with the proceeds, the, the building that's on the left here was built in the year 2000. And I see, and Ra also, and I see Razel has a shout out to you as well. Oh, that's very, very nice. Thank you, Razel. Uh, and and I would say, if, if anything, as we talk about all the time, our, one of our biggest problems right now is 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 space, that these two these two buildings are are in use all the time. It's hard to find a corner of the building to do something extra and and as we mentioned i guess that's um a good situation having no space because obviously that means that the growth is there as well uh we're happy it's a whole lot better than the alternative and then at the same time we're we're always just strategizing about how we can reconfigure our use of of, of space and and and, and, and you know space. and i think you you could uh you know this as well as when i was growing up it is very difficult to maintain older structures because obviously over time they you know, I, I, we had some ceiling issues, as you remember, in the, in the Park Avenue location. So it maintenance is needed. I mean, the building is, is a, over 100 years old now. And uh, structurally, you know, you had to do some renovations. Otherwise, I don't think you'd be able to go into the building any longer uh, the way things were going. So um, I think and there's my... Hello, Jack. Yes. I think you remember Jack. That's uh -huh. uh, my nephew. Uh, my uh, nephew. So... Um, I will note that the building, for example, like, yes, during one of our centennial celebrations, uh, we had a, a campaign to restore the building, but also to to do the kinds of structural Im improvements to the building that were that were necessary. Uh, the sanctuary is still not air conditioned, and that is also a challenge and a reminder that it's an old building. But you know what? That gives the mystique of the past. You know, having the this during the heavy days of the summer remembering what our uh, forefathers had to go through. So I guess good and bad. <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, and also, I think, um, so you know multiple languages as well. I, you know, when we were speaking a little bit earlier, 
Um, maybe you could mention some of them, even though if they're not fluent, you know, just even. Uh, sure. Well, as uh, as a rabbi, knowing Hebrew is very important. The Talmud that is so significant in in uh, uh, Jewish tradition is written partially in Hebrew and partially in Aramaic. So someone who is a scholar of the Talmud needs to be also uh, conversant in Aramaic. Uh, I've, I studied Spanish in high school, but I don't use it quite as much. And then for my graduate studies, which focused on uh, some topics in the history of German Jewry, I learned at least some and academic German's German. important because of the Yiddish uh, background as well. And then also, right, I, I mean, you know, Yiddish was, it wasn't even the language my parents spoke, uh, but the language my grandparents spoke so that my parents' generation wouldn't understand. But I did take uh, 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 two semesters of, of a Yiddish course while I was in rabbinical school so that I have some, I'm able to be conversant. And there's one of the documents that may show up in, in, in And Vivian in, in has Yiddish. a uh, shout out to me Oh, that's well. so wonderful. And I'll just note, my now you can learn Yiddish on Duolingo. So my daughter, who's 18, <laughs> 17, has been now making great progress in in uh, in learning Yiddish. So that, that's very nice. And so you're thank you the, to uh, Vivian and Grace for your nice words. And you're so you're from the the New York area then. In Actually, I grew up in the Washington D.C. Washington D.C. Ah, so you made the trek up north. Uh, so uh, you know your 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 three daughters have also witnessed this growth in Hoboken and. How do they like having both parents as rabbis? And uh, I'll have to ask them. <laughs> but they, I, they've obviously lived uh, through the Hoboken transition as well with you, with your life here in the Hoboken synagogue. So um, I think that's very nice. And you, you've lived in Hoboken the whole time as well, right? I think that is true. So uh, you know, you're it's it's nice to have that as well. Uh, and also, you're a musician, right? You. Uh, yeah. And I remember seeing you at the Hanukkah celebration. You had your guitar. And I think I don't ever see you without your guitar. Even, even when my parents were in the assisted living facility in Jersey oh, City. Right. Yes. You you brought your guitar and you had a show for for Hanukkah. So um, I guess that's also a trademark for your uh, for your life as well. I don't know if you have um, any PhD or any uh, advanced degree in in music as well. Not in music, no. no. You but, just so you picked it up and, on your. Uh... Uh, I've been uh, playing guitar since childhood and playing piano since I was a teenager, and and also um, in college, my opportunity to sing with and then to lead a, a Jewish choral group was a very important part of my of my life, and and actually connected to my choice of of career as becoming a rabbi. And now I'm sure I don't know if you when you were growing up. At first glance, you always wanted to be a rabbi, or was there anything else that you wanted to do, uh, or was it always? I was pre-med. <laughs> you were pre-med. Oh my! Yeah, God. <laughs> and uh, I know that I chose right. I know that I chose right for myself, and uh, I I feel very blessed to do what I do, and I feel very blessed to do it in Hoboken. You know, it's 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 a um, it's a great town. Uh, you know, I grew up in Hoboken. Obviously, I met my wife in another location, so. Usually you move to where uh, where that goes, but I do spend a lot of time in Hoboken, and the Hoboken Museum is fantastic. And I don't know if people know it, but you could visit the Hoboken Museum, become a member, and th with validated parking, you actually have three hours where you could actually go to the museum if you want to do something else in Hoboken for the three-hour period of time. So, uh, you know, I recommend people to become a member and to join. And it's just a wonderful place for people who want to see what Hoboken used to be like, and also, uh, you know, some of what it is today. Like, mm -hmm. like we're talking, yes. uh, talking as well. So, I think you're also um, with the Hoboken Shelter as well. With, uh... um, I've been connected to the Hoboken Shelter. I mean, the the synagogue was one of the founding organizations of the Hoboken Shelter back in the, I think, in the early 1980s or mid 1980s. And so we've had uh, connection to the to the shelter as well as to interfaith, other kinds of interfaith activities in Hoboken, the Hoboken Clergy Coalition, uh, and then more recently a, a countywide interfaith organization, the uh, the Interfaith Brotherhood Sisterhood or uh, Brotherhood Sisterhood Organization of Hudson County. Oh, very nice. So, and I guess all the so you're, there's many times you have to get involved with the other clergy within Hoboken as well as you just mentioned because. 
and it is a small town. It's only one mile. Um, do you get involved with any other surrounding towns like Jersey City and Union City as well? Or um, this, uh, the Brotherhood Sisterhood or, uh, Association is Hudson County wide and is, you could say, a broader interfaith coalition in that in Hoboken, the clergy represented in our clergy coalition are Jewish and Christian. And once you add in Jersey City and Union City, then it includes also Sikh and Baha'i and Muslim and Buddhist and Hindu. And so it is a very, as well very as, broad uh, based. as well as more varieties of Christian, as well as just more, more. Uh, connections. So thank you, Terry. Uh, Terry and thank you, Terry, yourself. very, very much. And I, I think one of the things that I brought up with you, um, so I, everybody knows I have mementos always because of thank, thankfully for my mother, she saved everything. So when I had my bar mitzvah in Hoboken, they used to give out this, um, I guess, sitter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess every bar mitzvah boy at that time used to get one of these that they used to hand out. And I think we were mentioning that, um, you went to school with somebody who signed this. Uh, well, the grandson of somebody. The grandson, Eli uh, Seligman, who was the president at that time. Right, yes. And, of course, Rabbi uh, Samuel Tabak. So I can only go far back beyond Tabak. I think it was Schnall. Mm -hmm. uh, Tabak, Marker, uh, Dickstein, who was the first woman rabbi in, I think, I don't know about the United States, but definitely within New Jersey. And then uh leia bass right yeah it was also ken katz was ken there, katz right? okay and i think who was before you uh before me was it was rabbi leah bass it was leah bass okay so you know very very nice to have this uh this whole thing i don't know if you give out anything today when uh, we do we give out a chumash uh, the torah and uh other biblical readings in the synagogue and in one volume we give out as well as a kiddush cup and also a yad, a Torah pointer that the students use when they are reading from the Torah on the day of their bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, as well as all the other Torah readers for that day use their, their yad that has their Hebrew name on it. So the congregation, as we spoke, is a very large building. So how are you doing filling up the building on, on a, you know, just for regular services? Do uh, you have a nice turnout? Uh... It's a nice, it's a nice turnout. We're, we're blessed that, uh, we, we are the Jewish home for a, a lot of people in our community, which is very nice. Um, both uh, people who are, let's say, adults coming to synagogue services of, of a wide variety of ages. We have a vibrant young professional community also. There's actually a young professional Shabbat dinner taking place tomorrow night that wow. still may have some room. If people want to go to our website to sign up, you're welcome to. And uh, as well as people of like throughout the age uh, spectrum, as well as kids of all ages. We have a preschool, we have supplemental educational program also. And our hope is that people whatever is their relationship with Judaism and Jewish tradition will find our community to be a comfortable place to take whatever that next step of their Jewish journey is. And I also see that you have a very good relationship with, uh, with the Rabbi Shapiro as well. I'm very the, glad to, from yes. From the Hanukkah thing. So I think, you know, it, it's, it's a growing community on both sides. And I think that's a very good, um, because back in the 70s and 80s, as I described to you, it was a very, very small population of uh, Jewish, um, you know, Jewish members in the town. And we tried to go through some of the uh, store owners that uh, had existed in, in Hoboken at that time. We didn't do very, very well with a lot of them. I know there was a, a farrier who was on uh, 6th and Washington, um, you know, Sorkin's. And you mentioned the drugstore. I think it's Seligman's uh, uh, drugstore. What, was that on uh, Willow? I think on Willow, Willow. yes. So <laughs> at home, I have something that Selma Silver, of blessed memory, whose photo may come up a little bit later, uh, had given me a list store by store of all the Jewish uh, uh, families that owned stores along First Street and along Washington Street. So I have this, and I will... I'll scan it well, and I'll give it to you. You know why this is important. And uh, well, Rand, Rand knows where I'm going with this. And uh, maybe some of the regulars on Hoboken Talks know this. We have an exhibition right now on the history of Washington Street. And we would love to add to that in terms of, uh, you know, just trying to 
get some more of the stores that are available. So this is something mm -hmm. that we could really follow up afterwards. Uh -huh. uh, there was also a project, uh, Grant, is it still ongoing where people can give uh, a minute of their audio? Uh, we're, we're toning it down a little right now. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you could contact the museum for, for more details, but so the, our, our whole connection. So this is something we really can uh, mm -hmm. expand on after this, uh, after this talk. This is great. Uh, so when you were growing up with your family, was it uh, always conservative or was it some orthodox mix in, in terms of the relatives or uh, what? That's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Both of my parents grew up going to conservative congregations. My mother in Troy, New York, my father in, in uh, some, well, his the community that he grew up, his parents were sometimes part of a conservative congregation, sometimes part of an orthodox congregation in, in Brooklyn. He went to an orthodox Jewish uh, day school in Yeshiva, Flatbush in, in Brooklyn. And uh, I have relatives who are all across the all across various types of uh, religious uh, observance. You know, I, when I was growing up in the um, in United Synagogue, now they may have claimed that they were a conservative synagogue, but I have news for you: in the '60s, '70s, it was a very, very strong Orthodox mix. So I. And I think that was good because it showed the united front that the synagogue have. Okay, so you want to keep everybody happy in a certain way. And then in the late uh, 70s and early 80s, I think then it started including more women and, and other things within the synagogue. And of course, Rabbi Dickstein uh, is a testament to that as well. So um, I think maybe this might be a good time unless you have other stories you want to mention to go to the pictures. I'd be happy to go to the pictures and share some of the some of the, the, the stories that are in the pictures. Okay. So now I grew up across the street from here. So I always wondered about this picture. You gave a lot more details of this whole um, structure. So maybe just expand on, uh, on those details. Sure. I don't remember the, the exact address, but it's the 600 block of Garden Street. And this was the building of Addis Amuna Congregation. And it was built in, if I'm not mistaken, 1879. And the building still stands today. And that makes it the oldest building in New Jersey built as a synagogue. So it has not been functioning as a synagogue since the 1960s. But that is one of the Hoboken firsts that we can be discussing. That this is the oldest existing building. So they uh, left in the 60s? Uh... So what happened, if I'm not mistaken, the community, Adis Amuna, moved to Leonia, sold their building to a church. I believe it's in the 1960s. That, and then, so the community still exists in, in Leonia. And uh, then after a couple of decades as a church, the building became residential and it is now residential. I've never been inside. I don't know how much inside you could even tell that it was built as a synagogue. And I think when I, uh, the early on, the stained glass windows may have been, uh kept there maybe uh ellen if she she could remember but i i i thought i remembered before it went residential that the church had kept some of the stained glass mm -hmm. from from the past uh so i walked by this all, all the time i had no idea of the history until you uh, you mentioned uh -huh. it uh uh tonight uh, all right we can go on to the uh next one okay so this is a picture of Rabbi Chaim Hershenson, who was a very significant Jewish uh, uh, personality and leader in Hoboken, and he has a fascinating story. He's probably the most illustrious Jewish leader in, in Hoboken that when I talk with people who are engaged in Jewish historical scholarship and also the history of, of Jewish law, um, as well as in uh, uh, the religious community of contemporary Israel, they've heard of Hoboken only because they know that Rabbi Hershenson used to live in Hoboken. So he was born in northern uh, well, in Palestine, what is now Israel, uh, to a family that had been a Jewish family in Palestine for, for uh, generations uh, and um, born probably in the 1850s and then came uh, um, became a rabbi and, and a significant uh, leader of that community, then moved to Constantinople, where at that time, uh, where he became the leader of a uh, Jewish school system, and then moved to Hoboken, New Jersey, 
and became the rabbi of the Moses Montefiore Synagogue, which was located at 80 Grand Street. So right, uh, not far, it's a couple oh, blocks yeah. from the synagogue, from, from the Star of Israel Synagogue. And he arrived in, we believe, 1903. And from 1903 to 1935, when he died, he was the most important Jewish leader of Hoboken and the whole Hudson County area. Oh, and he published also numerous books, most of which uh, um, are read uh, now much more than they were, I think, during his lifetime. He's somebody who was understood is understood now as like a visionary long before his time. He was uh, a lot of his books are about how does what does traditional Judaism look like in a democratic uh, 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 country? Um, he he loved the United States and loved the democracy that he got to experience in the United States. And um, he also was engaged in high level of uh, uh, correspondence with the top Jewish scholars around the world. Um, and one of the topics of special interest for him was uh, uh, in an effort to establish a, a Jewish state in Palestine, what will its character be? Uh, will it be a democracy? He said, definitely it would be a democracy. Will women have the right to vote? And he said, yes, of course women should have the right to vote. And he was saying this long before women oh. had the right to vote in the United States. Uh, should there be labor unions? He said, yes, there should be labor unions. And uh, there's a variety of very interesting so things. There's a number. Uh... You could say relatively so. And uh, there are a number of people who have written books and uh, doctor dissertations about the writings of Rabbi Hershenson, and he lived around the corner. He spoke at the dedication of the Star of Israel building. Oh. We have that in our in the notes, and every so often in our archives, he, he crops up. Now, the Moses Montefiore building burnt down in the 50s or 60s, and uh, periodically I will get inquiries from people saying, I'm doing research on Rabbi Hershenson. You live in Hoboken. Do you have access to his records? And I say, no, not a single because one. They, because they all burn. I mean, we don't know, but but maybe. I'll say one more thing about Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Hershenson. He had uh, 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 several daughters. One of his daughters was Tehillah Lichtenstein, who also, uh, growing after she grew up in first in uh, in Turkey and then in, uh, uh, then in, uh, in, in Hoboken, she then married uh, Rabbi Morris Lichtenstein, and together they founded the Jewish Science Movement, which is like a Jewish parallel to Christian science. Rabbi Lichtenstein uh, died at a relatively young age, so Tehillah Lichtenstein became essentially the leader of this oh. of this movement. And so, when people talk about how, uh, when did it happen that women became religious leaders, uh, significant religious leaders in American history, people often point to Tehillah Lichtenstein who never called herself a rabbi, was basically functioning as like a rabbi of this uh, Jewish science community. <laughs> so it is kind of interesting that not only Rabbi, Dick, rabbi Stephanie Dickstein, who we mentioned, um, but uh, Tehillah Lichtenstein are examples of, of, of women as, as uh, uh, Jewish religious leaders really long before their time uh, coming from Hoboken. Are there any pictures of the 80 Grand Street location? Around? I've never seen one. I've never seen one. But I did once... Um, uh, just take a walk around with somebody who remembered it from her childhood, who said that she thought that it was in a, a bigger building than the Star of Israel building. And you mentioned the location where the Park Avenue Synagogue probably wasn't the most desirable in Hoboken at that time. Well, I don't know. At that time, maybe it was, but I'll say it. It's also, we know that the Star of Israel Synagogue was founded the day after Yom Kippur, 1905, oh. which you might be wondering why would somebody found a synagogue the day after Yom Kippur? The only reasonable explanation is something happened on Yom Kippur in that other synagogue a couple blocks away, and the people people said, "Okay, never again." We're, <laughs> we're you know, that's certainly not going to happen next year. I mean, that's so. There are no records that demonstrate this, but that would be my theory that the Star of Israel Synagogue was a breakaway from the Moses Montefiore Synagogue a couple of blocks away. It just seems logical. Very, very interesting. So, and I as well did know this whole story about um, a lot of the synagogues that you presented to me uh, when when we were speaking. So, um, I guess we could go on to the next picture. Ellen, uh, Ellen's actually responded to your oh about, about the, stained, the glass. Uh, stained glass. All right, thank you, Ellen. 
Okay, yes, yeah, so this is uh, from the design for the Star of Israel building this is that was completed amazing. in 1915. So, yes. This is just an amazing picture. It really it really captures the essence of, of the building. It's exactly, it's exactly what the br blueprint shows. Uh, so we have a, um, in our social hall and I didn't bring it, but, um, we have a picture of this building under construction with the horse, with, uh, horse drawn carriages out in front of the, of the building, uh, when they're still building the facade. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but to put some of the beams and things of, of, of building of this size at that time, you know, I'm sure they had cranes, I would imagine, in uh, 1915. But, you know, to get some of these high heights and to be able to have a, a structure of, of, of this size is just just amazing. Obviously, there was electricity because, uh, you know, um, Edison had already invented that. But um, it... It really it, it follows exactly. I mean, we see the building on the uh, on the left of the screen and this blueprint, and um, maybe a little bit maybe. different because of the renovation. You know, the front of the window may be slightly different. Maybe. Oh, wonderful! Thank you. Yes. Ah. Oh, well done. Yes. <laughs> so we have this uh, copy of this bill of this picture uh, hanging in our uh, in in our in our social hall. Rand, thank you so Isn't much. That's cool. I'm yeah, a big amazing. fan of that photo. <laughs> that is that is thank just, you, Rand. That is just amazing. Uh, yeah, there's the horse-drawn uh, carriages and and the scaffolding. The roof is not completed yet. Uh, oh, there's a building on the right-hand side, uh, which is now an empty lot. Uh, on the right, on the um, as you're facing the building, the building on the right that is actually oh, that is interesting. Yeah, so right now that's a parking lot, though we're not using it as a we're not using it as a parking lot right now but yes i guess there i guess there was a building there so I, there was a row house at that time uh, i guess right, so. right next to the uh, right so. but then apparently on the other side there never was a building there until 2000 when we built this the our expansion right right very 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 nice uh, all right so just in terms of that whole um series of synagogues i mean obviously we're going to have more pictures coming up um, but related to this, any other any other stories, just in general, uh, outside the pictures about the congregation or anything, you know, that you could think of uh, in terms of just the expansion of this building with the, um, I guess, the funds from the sale of 830 Hudson Street. Uh, I guess that's the business office on the left for the most part, unless there's a nursery school as well. Well, there's a there are classrooms, there's classrooms. there are offices, including my office, the main synagogue office. And and you have to there. and you yes. have to take down the wall between the two buildings to have a connection, because th there was a brick, uh, you know, side of that. So um, there are doors connecting on each floor. And then how? So at that time when the when the renovation was taking place, did you still have services in the building? Uh, it's a long time ago. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not remembering. I think so. I I. Uh, um, we never moved to, let's see. There might have been some some weeks when services took place downstairs in the, in the social hall. Um, there was a period of time, almost a year, when we're working on the, uh, on the electrical and, and, and plumbing work that in the, the sanctuary, which has two levels, a, a level below and a, and a balcony, that there was an additional floor that was put in over the balcony so that work could be done ah, on the okay. balcony level, including the, the ceiling and roof, without it detracting from down below. So that happened for something like a year. And I don't know. I think it's like a four story like. building, right? Uh, would you say the height is, uh, I think it's approximately four stories for the roof. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a significant distance, uh, you know. Kudos to the uh, the construction workers. Um, I also remember that during I don't know if it was Irene or Sandy, the basement, you had significant flooding, I believe, in the basement, right? It was up to the ceiling of the basement. It was yes. up to the ceiling of the basement. Did you lose any artifacts because of that? I don't think we lost artifacts because it's not a programmatic area, but we did lose the boiler and the hot water heater, and it was a it was a challenge, uh, uh, but. It, we were fortunate that it happened at the time in the life cycle of our synagogue that it did, 
that the synagogue was able to to recover and you know the new building yeah. doesn't have a basement right? new building does not have a basement and did not experience flooding during sandy so that got up to street level then basically it, yes uh, oh my goodness that's uh luckily it uh, i guess the building structurally was so sound at least it survived that uh, significant flooding yeah um so I guess we can go on to the next picture now and uh sure so the next these next two are are two um advertisements from quite a long time ago about visiting clergy coming into the Star of Israel synagogue uh, in this one, it's in Yiddish on the right column and then in Hebrew on the uh, left column. You can see at the very, very top, in this one it says uh, on the Yiddish side, Congregation Star of Israel, 115 to 117 Park Avenue, Hoboken. Um, I had uh, noted the, at the bottom of this one as well as the next one is the, it notes who the printer is, Dubin Brothers, printers, 161 to 163 Newark Street, Hoboken. So this is describing uh, that there's a, a a guest rabbi who is uh, who is coming, maybe for an audition or maybe as a uh, uh, just as a as a guest speaker. The next one is about two visiting cantors, um, so saying that uh, this this one is <laughs> the 31st of July and the 1st of August, again in the in the year 1925. So. It is hard to imagine that in this unair un conditions, you know, <laughs> that they were having a major program at that time. Um, but the one one cantor from Jerusalem, one cantor from Philadelphia were coming to lead services on that day, and that there would be uh, uh, um, an onag, uh, a uh, a food served afterwards, right? That you would not quickly forget, and that it's all free. And that it's signed by the Shul committee, the, the synagogue committee. And it's, so all, we have, and it's yeah, all in Yiddish. It's all in Yiddish, yes. I mean, that's, uh, this is a community founded by Eastern European immigrants. And most of these early documents from the first 10, 15 years of the community are in uh, Yiddish. Well, I'm, I'm also wondering because um, my last name is German and my parents, um, my father's side came from the Lower East Side into uh, Hoboken. And I'm I'm just wondering because it's a German, maybe that's why they moved to Hoboken at that time. I mean, the that's tenements the tenements that they grew up in. If you ever see the the pictures of Lower Manhattan, or they're really not the greatest place to live. So I think Hoboken is really an uplifting park for for them as well. Uh, yes, I mean uh, scholars of uh, like historians of American Jewish history will sometimes refer to the quote unquote, areas of first settlement and areas of second settlement. And the, right, the uh, Lower East Side is an area of first settlement and Hoboken was an area of second settlement. So um, there were, we have, because sometimes we'll feel genealogical inquiries, um, we'll, we'll hear that uh, somebody will say, actually in some cases they say, um, uh, whatever the, the immigration records, you know, they indicated that my father's first residence was with Rabbi Chaim Hershenson. So it seems like Rabbi Chaim Hershenson, who we saw in the photo before, just uh, let his name and address be used for a whole lot of, uh, of, of immigrants coming through. So there were some people who came directly to Hoboken, but most of the Jewish community of Hoboken, it appears, had previously lived in the Lower East Side or other areas of first settlement and then saved up some money, came to Hoboken, Others might go to like other areas of second settlement for the uh, Jewish community in the New York area, included Harlem, included uh, uh, Williamsburg and uh, some other uh, um, uh, Brownsville and uh, some other parts of Brooklyn um, and some other parts of, of, uh, of Manhattan. It, it also fit into the um, Orthodox lifestyle at that time because it's a city of one, one square mile. So obviously walking is not a problem in Hoboken. And uh, as we know, you don't want to bring a car to Hoboken unless you really have to because because of the parking. So I think that that's also a big advantage in terms of the early, maybe the Jewish presence in, in Hoboken. But obviously it had to come from New York because that's where the, uh, I guess that's where, as you said, the first the first settlement uh, was. So, uh, all right, Ren, I guess we can go on to the next one. 
Okay, we saw this picture already. Oh, well, here you can see this is an old picture because you can see it says United Synagogue of Hoboken. And now those words, you, you can even tell in this photo, it was painted over um, that underneath where it says United Synagogue of Hoboken, it originally had said Star of Israel. Now again, it says Star of Israel. So Rand, that's very good, I guess. Uh, you, did, did you include this or did Rand pick this one up? I, I might have. I think I included it. You did include it because this does show the whole the whole front. Now, it's. I think that this is an older one, right? Um, oh, yes. tributes of Jewish war veterans. Well, you know, coming up, we'll have we'll have we have something to say about Jewish war veterans uh, in a couple slides. Now, this. So this is an older photo, though, because I think you mentioned the stained glass is now back in the front, right, of the building? Yes. Uh, so we have a member of our community, Susie Klein, who is a stained glass artist wow. who um, first restored painstakingly all of the stained glass from 100 years ago, and then also has created, together with a, a team of volunteers, new stained glass, some of which we have coming up in, in some oh, of these that, photos, that's too. Very, very nice. That is a lot of work, too. And it's, it's a lot of it's lead, lead yes. based, so it's still some not the best the chemicals in the world to use, but uh, that is really really fascinating. Then this captures, you know, what a really uh, a good image of what what the picture looks like uh, today. Uh, maybe you could go into details of the top structure, the green. Um, what what that I symbolizes? I don't know if you know. Of I don't know. I don't know at all. I mean, I've seen this on other synagogues too around the United States. Um, the, like this Middle Eastern type of, uh, you know, impression. But uh, I was always wondering about that. I couldn't, I couldn't say. Um, so this is a, apparently a draft of a document from the 1940s that ended up leading to the United Synagogue of Hoboken being this merger between the Hoboken Jewish Center and the Star of Israel Synagogue. So you can see, this is our evidence by what's crossed out that the Moses Montefiore Synagogue at one time was interested in being part of this merger, but ended up not being part of the merger, uh, okay? And now look at the paragraph which is crossed out, which is, be it further resolved that the vestry rooms of the Star of Israel building be converted into a Beit Hamidrash where Orthodox services may be held. That's also crossed out. And now if you look at uh, the, the previous paragraph, be it further resolved that the mode of worship be conservative with mixed pews. At this time, the primary difference between an Orthodox synagogue and a conservative synagogue was the machitza, the barrier, the, the separation between men and women, which would be hard to imagine an Orthodox synagogue without it and that conservative synagogues did not have it. So that is apparently why this group in the 1920s split off because they wanted to have a mixed seating service that in all other respects, it, the ritual was going to be much the same. Um, and, and also you note at the, um, the top paragraph, be it resolved that the, originally it said three and it kind of crossed out, it said two, <laughs> traditional synagogues of Hoboken. And um, that presumably the Adesamuna, the first photo that we saw, the reform synagogue was not part of this mix because its practices were different enough from the others, but that the gap between what, what, what was happening in a conservative synagogue and what was happening in an Orthodox synagogue was really not so great. Um, we also, by the way, have in Rabbi Chaim Hershenson's books um, that many of them were published with the financial assistance of the various communities mm. in Hoboken, including the Hoboken Jewish Center. So even though it was a conservative synagogue, they contributed to the publication of, of Rabbi Hershenson's uh, books. He's an Orthodox rabbi. Those communities seem to get along well or well enough. But this issue about the mix. will there be, right, right. Like it's, it appears that the Moses Montefiore synagogue said, we will join you in this merger if there can be a space for Orthodox services with a divider between men and women. And that, for whatever reason, they uh, uh, that didn't end up being what happened. And so then Moses Montefiore was not part of the merger. We don't know whether it was that everybody else said, no, we won't permit the Orthodox uh, services to take place. And then Moses Montefiore said no. Or if Moses Montefiore said no for some other reason, and then these other groups said, okay, well, then we don't need to provide a space for for uh, the Orthodox worship. You know, it's a shame because as as we discussed, really the 
you know, since there was only one synagogue remaining after the 50s, I think they did cater very nicely to the Orthodox crowd. So, you know, it's a shame maybe they didn't have the foresight that they could just have not discuss it. They didn't maybe want it as a formal document in case there were any arguments in the future. But I know for the high holidays, the women sat upstairs. Even, oh, that's interesting. Even back in the 60s and uh, the men were downstairs. I don't remember for my bar mitzvah if, if uh -huh. it was mixed or not, but definitely for the high holidays. That uh, is fascinating. I did not know that. So, I mean, I, I always thought it was, uh, you know, more in the Orthodox leaning uh, style and maybe, but that's because of some of the old timers maybe were still of the Orthodox mm -hmm. uh, mode. Uh, but this is a, a very fascinating document. Uh, so total, I mean, I, I think we have more pictures showing the total number of synagogues in Hoboken. You mentioned the one on Grant Street, and we have the one on Garden Street, of course, uh, the Hoboken Synagogue. And I think we have one coming up on... Um, I don't it? think there's another photo of another synagogue, but the there's the, the Hoboken Jewish Center on... On, on, on 830 Hudson, Hudson, Hudson Street. Street. Those are really the four... The four major ones. I mean, to that we could add. Now there's Chabad of Hoboken, which is right. now located at 720 Monroe in the Monroe Center. Um, I mean, obviously, it, as we discussed, it takes a lot to maintain these buildings, and if you don't have a large enough congregation, there's no way you can can really do what you need to be done. So, I guess it made sense at that time. It's interesting. It took place as far back as 1946. I thought it was later in the process, but. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's that's really uh, right after the, the war. I don't, I don't know if the war had just ended at that time. I don't yes, know. So, yes. So, oh, OK. So this is 830. <laughs> uh, the, right in the middle is 830 Hudson Street. And you can see the stained glass is is uh, is there in that picture and is still there, to my knowledge. Rand, thank you. And I, as I mentioned to you today, if the synagogue had held on to that building, it probably be, would be worth a million dollars more than what it was sold back in uh, at least in in the nineties. Um, yes, yeah, so see, Ellen Ellen has verified that as well. So uh -huh. you you did not know that, did you? Um, well, I mean, was it a was it that? I mean, even today, there are some people who who have a preference to sit upstairs. No, but and, this was this was the, basically right. the mechitza. That's how. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if it was because I didn't go all the time. I usually went in the evening services, but um, you see that it, it, even as late as the 60s, this was still, uh -huh. this is still very, going on. That's very, very interesting. But uh, this is this is really a, a fascinating document. And I, I, I was there for many years and I never knew this had, uh -huh. this had existed. Okay. So, yeah, we talked about this a little bit uh, uh, before. So this is in Church Square Park. And it is a combined monument to Guglielmo Marconi, inventor of the uh, radio, and the four chaplains, uh, four American, now I can't remember, I, I presume Navy chaplains uh, from the uh, USS Dorchester, which was a, a, a ship that was torpedoed in the North Atlantic in uh, 1943 by the Nazis. And that there's this heroic story that became a very, uh, just a very significant demonstration of interfaith cooperation that these four chaplains, two Protestant, one Catholic, and one Jewish, um, that they were entitled because of their rank as, as uh, chaplains, uh, they were entitled to uh, life jackets and spots in lifeboats, but they gave it up they, for, to the enlisted men so that people's uh, last sight of them oh, was the goodness. four of them praying and uh, and embracing each other and this became at a time of not insignificant uh, uh religious and cultural strife in the united states a symbol of such coexistence so there are many places in the united states where there are monuments to the four chaplains there were the four chaplains on postage stamps also um, it happens that two of them and i just cannot remember which two have some connection to hudson county uh, one of them is from jersey city one of them was from hoboken and uh and so that apparently has something to do with why this monument is here. The question that is unanswered, except that we have a few theories, is why would you combine a monument to the four chaplains and the, from the USS Dorchester with a monument to Guglielmo Marconi, inventor of the radio? It is something which makes really no sense. The pedestal only mentions that this is a monument to Marconi. 
and not the four chaplains. and not the and not the four chaplains. So apparently, the the pedestal was actually made for a different statue because the 1939 World's Fair included a statue in honor of Marconi, but not a statue of Marconi, but a statue of a uh, of of an unclothed woman, and uh, it was then uh, transported to Hoboken for eventually to be uh, to be raised presumably because of the uh, prominent Italian American uh, community in Hoboken and the pedestal was made to fit the size of that statue uh, but then uh, something happened to the statue uh, some some say well it, it decayed or you know in, in transit or as uh, has also been suggested it uh, uh, it didn't seem like it would be the right statue to fit uh, um, Hoboken and um, apparently it was the mayor of Hoboken at that time who made the oh okay so here we have the original statue from the World's Fair okay so this is the statue which could have been in Church Square Park but uh, uh, was uh, was not but this Marconi statue that was a replacement statue was just too short to be able to be seen with this because it's really not right yeah, for the size of the pedestal. pedestal is so big uh, right. so, compared to the statue, the right. statue itself. And it's also possible that the resonance of a statue in honor of Marconi was different in 1939 and in 19, I can't remember, the late 1940s, or early 1950s when this ended up uh, being uh, being put up because of the relationship, a good close relationship between Marconi and, and Mussolini so that it may be that there's a desire to put something on this statue that would affirm the the heroism of the allies and so the four chaplains became such a such a symbol so it is a very unusual combination but every year there is a, a gathering organized by uh now i can't remember which the i guess the american legion post mm. or, or veterans organizations in honor of and in memory of the heroism of the four chaplains. And I never knew this story until until you brought it up. So I, it, it's amazing because basically they they gave up their life to save the other uh, sailors on the uh, on the ship. Mm -hmm. You don't see that much anymore, but it's and it's a tough that's a tough call to do. But it showed also their spiritual um, strength to be able to do something like that. Yes. So speaking of uh, war veterans, so this is a picture of Stanley and Selma Silver of blessed memory. And, and uh, we've included this photo just because of they represent the generation that kept the synagogue alive at a time when the Jewish population had really dwindled, as did uh, your parents, Bernie and Helen uh, Kammer of, of Zichon Amli Bracha of blessed memory. Um, there was a relatively small group of people who had uh, uh, roots in Hoboken and were deeply connected to the synagogue community. And uh, my sense is that much of the time they didn't expect that it would survive. And they certainly did not expect that it would grow and thrive, um, that it would probably be, you know, now as, as large or larger as it ever even was at its founding. Um, and, but we, without, and, yes. and remember, it did. They saw the shrinkage as well, mm -hmm. and the mergers that we we've, we've spoken about. Right. So, I guess they did not leave. I mean, some some of the other Jewish population did leave Hoboken, and maybe because of the merger, maybe because of the the flight to the suburbs. Not sure, but um, you know, my parents came in 1936. Oh, well, my father came in 1936. My mother was later. Mm -hmm. uh, Stanley Silva, I don't know um, when he first came to Hoboken, but... Selma was born and raised in Hoboken. Oh, Selma was born yes. and raised in Hoboken. Oh, very, very, very... Uh, nice. And also, Stanley was a, a national leader of the Jewish war veterans. He was the, the if I'm not mistaken, national chief of staff. Is a, um, and... Oh. And it's a, one of the, the significant... Uh, uh, leaders, Jewish communal leaders of national scope from Hoboken. And I, I mentioned to you it, it, a very hilarious uh, comment to uh, Stanley as well as my um, my father. So um, Hoboken used to have the parades and the Jewish war veterans were one of the parades. And Stanley, I guess, was the one that probably was instrumental. But uh, to see about the seven or eight of them walking down <laughs> Washington Street and, uh, you know, they're not, they were just, 
uh, I guess many years after being soldiers, but it was just hilarious with the banner and having them walk down Washington Street together. Um, you know, they, I guess their size had dwindled over the years, but Stanley made sure every single one of those parades that they could get in, that they would they would watch. And it was a, a very, very nice sight to uh -huh. walking down the street. Uh, I have no pictures of it, but, uh, you know, it was, it, you know, just it just left a good, good memory. Um, and I think um, Stanley, did he, was he able to stay in uh, Hoboken the whole time, even with the later years of his uh, health and everything? Uh, yes, he uh, he passed away. I mean, more than fifteen years ago at this point. But uh, yeah, he was living in Hoboken as as was uh, Selma until Selma until the end well. of the, until the end of their lives. Which is very because today, obviously, people don't stay around uh, except people like yourself who uh, who remain. You no, know, I'll say there's more and more people who are. Yes, I mean, uh, there's a as is the case in when the community was founded, that there were a large number of people who came to Hoboken and stayed for just a few years and then moved somewhere else. There's a relatively large number of, of Jews in the American Jewish community who have ancestors who at some point passed through Hoboken. And I will also say there's a huge number of, of uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, children and young adults, you know, age uh, zero to 25, who spent some short portion of their childhood <laughs> in Hoboken and now live around the, you know, around the New York area and especially around the New Jersey suburbs. Um, but we've been so happy that as, as Hoboken becomes uh, a more, uh, it's, there are more and more people choosing to raise their families in, in Hoboken in connection with the Hoboken Jewish community. That has been really a wonderful thing for us. That we also love maintaining our connections with those who've, who've moved out. Our goal, one of our goals as a synagogue is to be the kind of place that will give people some of the Jewish experiences and also leadership tools that they can then take to whatever community they're going to next. And frankly, it's one of the things that makes being the rabbi of the synagogue in Hoboken, a really engaging well, opportunity. It's constantly a churn of, of people as well as this vast diaspora. So your to your, keep your connections because of that with the, the transitional, and, it, and it's less transitional than it was at, maybe at the beginning. So your contacts probably are really uh, many places in the United States where people have further moved to. I mean, Jobs aren't what they were in the past, where people stayed in one company for many years. So mm -hmm. you may see somebody going to the uh, West Coast or to the Midwest, um, and uh, you know, I think it's it is a sign of the time. I think things are settling down. The pandemic, I think, has also maybe made people want to stay um, not as traveling as much. But you know, I think also you know we mentioned uh, also Rabbi uh, Shapiro as well. I that never would have happened in a community that was a jewish presence was dying oh of because course. what's yes. what's the point uh, of having more jewish growth if you don't have a jewish population that could sustain that and i i think that's that's good i hope it continues for many years to to come obviously um uh, but it's it's been it's been a really uh really really nice to see the uh, the growth of, of the entire community, the Jewish community, hopefully, especially compared to what I had uh -huh. when I when I was growing up, uh, I think maybe we had five of us in the, the Hebrew school program. Oh wow! At the yeah. So it was really, really, really small. We had a lot of older congregants, but the younger congregants just right. just were not there. Uh, so okay, so here's oh yes, okay, so this is nine hundred Jefferson Street. Uh, which is not a historic Jewish building, but there was a historic Jewish building on this site, which was the headquarters of Kitav Publishing for many decades, which is a Jewish educational publisher. And uh, the claim to fame here is that they had a plastic dreidel press. And so a huge proportion of plastic dreidels manufactured in the United States were manufactured on this corner, 900 Jefferson Street in the headquarters of Kitav Publishing. Wait, so. wait till Bob hears hears that. <laughs> I, 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 he'll be, he'll be. I, he may have known that, Rand. I don't know. Uh, yeah. We'll have, we'll have to see. <laughs> but uh, okay. And then this is the synagogue uh, of, uh, of of today. So this captures inside uh, very mm -hmm. nicely. And I guess this is at the end of the uh, Yom Kippur services, right? I think. Uh, mm -hmm. 
but yeah. uh, it now that's a very full presence of uh, of congregants. So I think this this is a testament to you as well because. I mean, you have a full house here uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, obviously the the High Holidays does have an attraction of more people anyway, but uh, very nice. Any symbolism with the lighting or uh, that some people uh, Just have? that the kids, it's hard to see, but in the the, the bottom of the photo um, is the Bima area and that there are kids, the, these, uh, the glow sticks are distributed ah, specifically to kids okay. as a way of involving them. You can also see the Havdalah candle, the twisted candle uh, for the end of Shabbat, but also the end of, of, uh, of Yom Kippur. So yeah, this is an especially festive moment, but we're so glad that there are many, many times over the course of the, of, uh, of a year when the, when, when the, the community is, is is full and uh and and uh time of of a vibrant celebration this being one of them and we're we're looking forward to the uh the post-pandemic uh yom kippur as has, well as very um so yeah maybe you could mention the, the the i guess the difficulties of having a congregation during a pandemic i mean with the mask and everybody and everything else, people being uncomfortable going, namely me, myself. Uh -huh. And so I, I think there was a reduction probably at one point with this whole, this whole process going on. Um, Definitely true. I mean, we are still, we still require masks in the sanctuary. Uh, our educational programs just stopped requiring masks within the last couple of weeks and uh definitely that we've i mean because of the omicron variant we weren't serving any food in the synagogue from jan in the months of january and february and we started again in uh in in march i think you're doing it outside right for some of the food serving whenever it's possible we serve food outside yes it's it's true <laughs> except uh, in the winter obviously right like and, but definitely also there i mean there are people who are just not comfortable coming or not comfortable coming and eating and Jews, right? I mean, and not just Jews, obviously, it's about everybody, but eating is very, very central to the the process of building a community. So Did I'd you... say it's been harder for us to put our best foot forward as a, as a community. So it, better now than it was, let's say, last year at this time, and it was better last year at this time than it was the previous year at this time. And we're... I mean, it was a portion myself. I wasn't going for the, mm -hmm. for the same reason. Uh, I think things are improving, uh, but you know, I mean, it's still good to be careful, uh, mm -hmm. you know. But I, th I think we've we've definitely come a long way, um, and I think uh, oh. So these are just two examples. This one and the next one of the stained glass windows created by Susie Klein, designed uh, by Susie Klein, that represent the days of creation. This one is. Um, I think this is one of the ones uh, depicting the seventh day of creation and and Shabbat. So you have some of the uh, um, animals and also vegetation and lots of things from the, I, I believe that's what this window is. And then the next, the next slide is the newest window that was just put in a couple of, a couple of weeks ago um, with uh, depictions of, uh, of, of stories about animals in various parts of the Bible. So you have Daniel and the lion's den up above, uh, you have Noah's Ark, and Noah's Ark is on the right-hand side. And then down below, you have the ram from the story of the binding of Isaac. And at the very, very bottom is uh, Rebecca uh, giving water to the camels of uh, Abraham's servant. And then each one is connected to biblical verses that describe the, the events. Very, and very so well. we are, we're very excited. And, we, and um, as beautiful as it is here, it's even more beautiful in person. And it's even more beautiful in person during the daytime. So we love when people come by to, and uh, to, Lewis, to see Lewis it. says it's gorgeous. So. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so Ellen, shout out. Uh, by the way, um, uh, Pam and Naomi earlier on said that they remember the parade with, uh, uh -huh. with my Wonderful. brother. It just didn't come up. So I think at this, at this point, um, I don't know if there's, Anything else you want to share that you we didn't discuss for the last uh, you know last hour that you might want to bring up? Anything else about? Um, I mean, I think you have a, the Hoboken um, uh, Synagogue has a nice web page as well, and I think you have 
you have one as well related to your music and other other type of uh, sermons you may have done as well. So I think people should check that out in terms of the uh, you know the actual uh, publication page on on Facebook. So um, you know if that's it, then we could we could have closing the show. So um, uh, Rabbi Schomburg, thank you so much for uh, for you know giving us this history, the Jewish history of Hoboken for the last hour. I really appreciate it. I think the audience appreciate it. And as you know, this is all about history as well. So I think you captured that, um, you know, not only as a spiritual situation, but in terms of just the Jewish history of Hoboken in general. And uh, um, and Rachel said as well, she learned so much. I think everybody who tuned in. So, you know, we kind of did this uh, contact with you to see if you would join. I'm so glad you did. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Glad to. Do and it. we don't want you to be a stranger here to the museum as well. You know, you could uh, come by anytime you want. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, I enjoyed it as well. I did not know a lot of what you presented. And I not only was I at the Hoboken Synagogue, but I lived in Hoboken as well. Um, and there, uh, Grace says the same thing. So mm -hmm. you. you really gave a nice, uh, like, and, and I think you mentioned as well, there's other. Um, artifacts that you might send our way to the Hoboken Museum that maybe oh, we have a lot we have a lot we've for a long time we've been thinking oh how can we what would an exhibit about the about Hoboken's Jewish history look like and the various people who have collected some of these items uh, we also have a, a congregational uh, uh, records in the um, in the library of the Jewish Theological Seminary some of them are in Yiddish and we've gotten them translated. Some of them are in English and there's plenty for an exhibit. And, and when we also, when we do the, the close out, we're going to mention the exhibit downstairs. So afterwards we have to definitely get your knowledge of some of the Jewish businesses that existed on Washington street. So we could fill in some of the gaps in terms of the mm -hmm. uh, display downstairs. So that's also going to be very, very, uh, very helpful. So um, I think at this point, maybe we can, we can, wrap up the show and uh, give the closing credits. So um, thank you for uh, attending Hoboken uh, Talks. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, Margot St. Galise with uh, Bill Miller doing the host. And then after that is Jerry Citro with uh, Stu uh, Chircher Celli. Uh, and he will also be, um, you know, doing the, the hosting at that point. Um, Mel Curtin left a nice, um, you know, donation from his will for the Hoboken Museum. And we really appreciate uh, his help helping us out, as I mentioned, from his estate planning. So that was very, very nice of uh, Mel Kiernan. And also the New York, uh, New Jersey uh, Historical Commission uh, has also helped us uh, tremendously with the Hoboken uh, Museum. And we also appreciate their help as well. And the New Jersey Council for the Humanities also has been a very, very, uh, uh, very helpful for the Hoboken uh, Museum. And our shipyard circle, these are our, um, they give uh, larger amounts of donations, but we appreciate everybody, obviously, who participates in terms of helping us out, becoming a member, and please uh, become a member of uh, the Hoboken Museum. As you see, we have our guests, we have a lot of exhibits and things. Um, so, you know, come by and uh, as, as mentioned, the, um, the three hour parking validation. So people, if you wanna come by, see the museum and do other things in Hoboken for three hours. And also the applied uh, development company who is giving us this uh, lease at a very, very reasonable rate. And they also helped my family stay in Hoboken for many, many years. So um, very, very nice in terms of all they do for the Hoboken Museum and for Hoboken. And uh, as we mentioned, we have our um, exhibit, The Avenue, which is a history of Washington Street, which is uh, on the lower level of the museum. Come by, take a look at it. It gives a lot about the history of the different stores as we were talking about on, on Washington Street. And also in our upper gallery, uh, Liz and Abel Nodoye have an exhibit called The Adjacent, which is uh, pictures on glass. So you could come by and visit that as well. It's going to be uh, until May first, and that's that's at the museum as well. And also, please comment, like, share, and subscribe our page. Uh, YouTube is 
our home base. So um, you could watch our previous shows on uh, that we've had uh, for Hoboken Talks, as well as many other um, pieces of information about the museum. And uh, yeah, thank you, Jane. So thank you. Uh, very, very nice. And uh, we, again, really, really appreciate you coming by uh, to the museum. Um, so we're signing off now. This is from the Hoboken Historical Museum. And thank you for uh, attending our show tonight.